So thanks everyone for joining us. This is um, our third actually online event that we ran this week, which is really exciting. It's always great to have um, awesome content and speakers to bring to you. Uh, so this is uh, another online meetup, best practices on how to process and analyze audit logs with Delta Lake and structured streaming. So just a quick call out, we have two ways to join. Uh, folks are joining us on YouTube Live. So I'd suggest turning on your notifications. That's a great way to uh, stay up to date and informed on uh, upcoming online tech talks because we stream everything um, live through YouTube as well. And that's also where uh, the video recordings uh, live in the uh, playlist, the online meetups playlist. Uh, there's the link there. And I can also drop that in the chat after I'm done presenting. And then we also have our data plus AI online meetup group. So if there's anyone joining from YouTube who's interested in, in joining us there, um, Zoom is gonna, if you join through Zoom, that's what you, how you're gonna be able to ask questions and kind of engage a little bit more with the speakers and um, ask questions. Uh, so I'd encourage all of you to join in both areas, both spaces. We also have some great other content um, in our YouTube channel. So check, check that out. And then just a quick call out for our uh, Spark and AI Summit is coming up. I, it's June 22nd to the 26th and it's completely virtual. Um, so uh, we have a lot of awesome training opportunities for you. And uh, as kind of like a thank you to our community, we have a 25% off discount code for you. So use that code in that red box uh, to uh, get discount if you're interested in the training options. And I'll also drop the link to that as well. Um, and just before I pass it over to Denny uh, to do some speaker introductions, uh, I just want to do a, a call out. So chat's going to be great for if there's any audio issues or anything um, that I can help troubleshoot. I'll be moderating that uh, while the presentation's going on. And then if you have any questions for the speakers, uh, please drop those in the Q&A feature. Um, so that's going to be the best way that Denny and the speakers are going to be able to keep track of questions coming in and, and answer what they can if they have some time. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Denny. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. All right, rock on. Well, hey, welcome to this awesome Delta Lake Tech Talk. We're going to be doing it interview style with demos as well, of course, so that way we don't make it a little bit too boring. We will put some slides in just to give some concepts, but uh, we definitely want to make this a conversation. So because we do want to make this a conversation, um, what we'd love you to do is to go ahead and um, make sure you chime in your questions in the Q&A. Okay, so there's a Q&A at the bottom. We'd love to see those questions. So if you can go do that, that would be awesome. So saying that, um, uh, let's switch to our uh, speakers. Hey, Craig, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Andy. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Ying. I'm a customer success engineer uh, at Databricks, and so you know I work with customers who um, you know are customers. So they're you know they're folks who um, have already purchased Databricks, and I work with them on you know, uh, everything related to, you know, implementations, um, kind of architectural discussions, uh, and just generally, you know, helping them be successful uh, with Databricks. It's great to be here. Nice to have you on board, Craig. Well, hey, Miklos, why don't you introduce yourself as well, please? Hi, I'm Miklos Christine. I'm a solutions architect here at Databricks. I previously worked at Cloudera. I've been in the big data space a while. As of my role here, I work with uh, existing customers and new customers, identify their business use cases and see how our software can help solve those problems. So I'm happy to be here to talk about an internal workflow that we do today that also helps our customers. Perfect, okay, well then actually that leads us to the first question. So we're talking about helping our customers, which is always a great thing to be customer obsessed. So can let, let's start with that. How can you be customer assessed when we're talking about audit logs? What, why does audit logs, are, are they even important for the customers? Now, hopefully I don't sound too dumb when I ask that question, but for a lot of folks, they, they wanna understand that context. So why don't you guys take it away and explain that concept, please? Yeah, I could touch upon that. So audit logs provide a lot of valuable information of how users are engaging with your platform. And by providing this, level of detail about different pieces of the software. It helps the admins or the business owners understand who's using the platform, who's utilizing it efficiently, 
as well as who's having challenges, because we're not only audit logging the successful thing, we're also audit logging if people are having issues. And that also gives a good idea of what's being done on the platform and how we can improve. And when you have many users and you can imagine enterprise organizations have hundreds of users, you can't always go ask and pull everyone to figure out all these things. But with data, you can answer a lot of questions and then ask more specific questions to, to answer and, and help out your user base. So audit logs are really valuable for improving the overall experience with any data and analytics workflow. Perfect. And so since we're talking about the Databricks service in terms of looking at the audit logs behind it, are there some cool examples that, uh, that, um, that you could provide in terms of us looking at the audit logs allowed us to understand the service? For example, one that perhaps comes to mind is, for example, uh, the introduction to Spark R or any other ones that happen to be handy for you. Yeah, one question that we get from our customers is what, what are their notebooks that they're using? And we have a lot of templates and they wanna know who's using which clusters and how many people are cloning these notebooks and leveraging them and using them. And that's a great way that we can identify and help present that to the end users. And we can create dashboards and repeated workflows to do that. Another thing is cluster configuration. We have made it a lot simpler. Let's just see what Spark releases are the most popular that people are using. Are people trying bleeding edge versions or are they sticking with really the long time supported versions and are fine with that? So it does allow us to answer some key questions of what people are using within the platform and then how we can improve on that as well. Got it, that's, yeah. that's really, oh, go ahead, Craig, please. Sorry to interrupt. Cool. Yeah, and just, just out of that, you know, I think it's, um, you know, I think there are other things that you know, uh, our considerations for admins, you know, in the sense that, um, for example, like if you have resources that are, have been provisioned, but, um, you know, like maybe there's no auto termination set on them, right? That's a feature that we have in Databricks that, you know, if a cluster goes idle, uh, you know, the, the, it'll, it'll spin down automatically. And so it could be that you have, you know, users who aren't aware of that. And so they, they uncheck auto termination and, you know, they just have the, this, you know, the resources, um, continue on for, you know, essentially an indefinite period of time. And so you can use audit logs to help identify those resources, um, not only to, you know, to terminate them and make sure that, you know, you're not, you know, wasting uh, compute resources on, on nothing, but also to, to help educate users and let them know, hey, you know, you should leave this on or, uh, you know, things like that. So it, it's, it's not just about identifying, um, you know, any of these anti-patterns, but it's also about helping you educate your users uh, on kind of the right way to use the platform. Got it. Oh, so super interesting. So, okay. So now we're thinking about this prospect of like lots of logs that actually do in fact provide a lot of cool business value. But then I guess the question is like, well, how, how are you storing all this? So what are you doing? What's the process by which to take these logs that are just churning out of some system and then eventually getting some value out of it? I'm pretty sure. I, and I'm pretty sure that's the purpose of today's session, by the way, but the context is, you know, What's that flow? What's that process workflow uh, that you're going to describe? And by the way, for those who are attending online right now, we will switch to demos uh, soon. So don't worry. <laughs> Craig, I'll let you go first. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. So I think at least, you know, if, if we speak about, you know, Databricks audit logs specifically, um, they are delivered uh, as JSON files uh, to our, our customers S3 buckets. Um, you know, and I think that that file format is, is fine for, uh, you know, for, for transporting the data, uh, you know, but in terms of making sense of it, you know, like I think there are certain ways we structure the data that, uh, you know, makes sense in terms of streamlining delivery, but, you know, w when you're actually analyzing it, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily like the, the, the easiest to use. And so, um, you know, as any alluded to, uh, uh, we will be going into a demo where we actually walk you through, um, you know, how to utilize structured streaming in Delta Lake to, uh, take all these uh, raw data, um, you know, put it into, uh, you know, what we call our medallion architecture, where we have bronze, silver, and gold tables, where, you know, at a high level, what's happening is um, we're doing, you know, applying transformations, we're cleaning, um, we're enriching the data. And so, you know, once we get to those gold tables, uh, it's, it's much easier for admins to query the data, you know, we, we kind of split them out into, uh, you know, different tables in a sensible way. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's all about, um, 
you know, being more performed, but also uh, just making it generally easier to use. And just to add to Craig's point, since we're talking about goal tables, uh, we actually have previous tech talks from part of this Delta Lake online tech talk series that actually describe in detail a little bit about that Delta architecture in terms of the bronze, silver, gold. So we're, we're sort of jumping ahead into these, con applying these concepts right away, as, as you can tell from today's session. So uh, related to that, oh, actually, before I continue on, uh, Miklos, did you want to add to exactly what Craig was calling out? No, I think he covered it and this demo will cover more of it. So I okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, perfect. Well, then be, uh, we're, we're going to switch the demo in about five, uh, in a few more minutes, but I did want to uh, talk a little bit about the concepts before we run into it, which is uh, a little bit about why specifically, why conceptually, why structured streaming and why Delta Lake? Um, yeah, uh, happy to do that. Uh, let's see. So we did uh, prepare a few slides. I think that'll kind of, um, you know, we, we'll we'll reiterate uh, why why you should care about auto logs, and then we'll we'll step into um, you know why why you why we use Delta Lake and why we use structured streaming. So uh, give me just one second. Sure, sure, no problem. Apologies for jumping the jumping the ship on that one. Then <laughs> uh, no, 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 no worries, no worries. All right. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, yeah. we can. Cool. Cool. Um, cool. So, so just uh, uh, for a high-level agenda, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're we're going to talk about, you know, why auto logs are important. We'll kind of reiterate what uh, what we've already covered for folks who who might have joined a little bit late. Um, we'll we'll talk about you know why we chose Delta Lake and then why structure streaming and then. From there, we can we can jump into the demo. Great. So, why are audit logs important? What we've covered already is that it gives the admins or the business owners a lot of information about how they use a big data platform. Now, with just using open source tools, it's really hard to track this. If you're stitching together a lot of different components, it's not centralized. And you have to stitch together a lot of things just to try to get some valuable insight. So with Databricks, we help track and audit log all of these actions so that admins can understand, are we using resources efficiently? Are there too many clusters or that are too small? Should we use bigger clusters? Um, is there malicious activity? Are people trying to break into specific notebooks, but they're getting an error all the time? Or even just user engagement. What are most popular notebooks that people are using? Are they using R the most or Python? Now, combining this, we also have cloud provider logs. We can get a full picture of what the data platform looks like. With S3 logs and EC2 logs, we can understand that full underlying infrastructure. So we go to the next slide. Now, why do we choose the Delta Lake design? Delta Lake allows us to efficiently translate that JSON data into a better format for Spark to process. We're gonna be slicing and dicing the data using SQL and possibly data frame APIs. And we wanna do that if, as efficiently as possible. So with Delta, it allows us to use binary formats. Underlying is Apache Parquet, which is a columnar format where there's better compression and data skipping and a lot of other cool things we can do to make the queries fast. Now, Delta allows us to gracefully handle schema evolution where we have an evolving data set. As we add new services, we need to add data to the audit logs. One of those parameters that we'll be talking about is the request parameters, which is a struct field in that JSON structure that is going to be evolving over time. Now, Delta also does something really cool, which is it provides schema validation on write instead of read. Traditionally, data platforms do lazy evaluation and do validation on read. So it's not until someone actually reads the data will you understand or figure out if there's an error. Now with Delta, we wanna change that paradigm and say, let's verify while we're writing so that there's no problems down the line. You don't wanna set one or a ticket 
where you're blocking people from doing their analysis or their day jobs because someone changed a data type from an int to a decimal or something that's minor and very common in these, in these scenarios. But you want to do that uh, validation on write. So we remove that risk of schema inconsistency. Now, we also take advantage of the performance optimizations like Optimize, where we can improve the read performance. Now, Optimize is a thing that we can do to pack together many small files and efficiently lay out the data in these binary formats like Parquet. So Optimize will allow us to do that and gather statistics so we can do column skipping and other things that are going to improve the read performance while you're doing your slicing and dicing and analytics. And I'll let Craig talk about the next portion. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, for, the, for this final slide, you know, motivating how we've designed this entire architecture, um, you know, we'll talk about why we chose structured streaming. Um, you know, first bullet point, state management, state management, state management. Um, the reason why we chose, like one of the you know, main reasons we chose structured streaming is um, rather than having to reason about, uh, you know, where, when we last processed based on, you know, a record ID or, or a timestamp uh, or something like that, you know, we allow structured streaming to, uh, to handle all that state management. So we can use uh, the built-in checkpointing and write ahead logs to ensure that we're only processing the newly added audit logs, right? So, you know, rather than saying, okay, we're, we're, we're going to check the latest date. Okay. It was, you know, what is it like May, uh, like May 12th, right? So we'll process just May 13th using structured streaming. Uh, we're now able to just say, okay, we're, we're based, you know, we're using offsets based on files and not necessarily based on timestamps. So again, it, it just kind of simplifies that it, it, it takes out, um, you know, that kind of additional piece of logic that you might've had to write in. Um, and then, you know, I think most folks, when they think about structured streaming, right, they think, oh, this has to be uh, only for, for streaming type data. The way we can architect this job and the way we, you can, I guess you can architect any job, but the way we've architected this particular job is um, we utilize structured streaming's uh, trigger once functionality uh, with a daily job. And so we, we treat them kind of like pseudo batch jobs, right? So, you know, th there are a couple different paradigms with, you know, when you're using streaming technologies, right? One, one is to, uh, you know, to have continuous processing with an always on cluster. And, you know, again, that's, if you have that kind of SLA, that requirement where you need data as quickly as possible, that, that is definitely a valid architecture, uh, but it is, it can be quite costly. Now, you know, if you have, if your SLAs um, are a little less stringent, uh, you know, or if data are arriving um, at, you know, less frequent intervals, uh, you can, you know, explore using this trigger one functionality with, you know, daily, weekly, monthly jobs, et cetera. Uh, and that functionality will kind of, uh, will still benefit you uh, either way. And so, um, you know, we certainly do have a, a, you know, additional resources on this. Uh, we have a blog that uh, explains the benefits of using trigger once to reduce costs. Uh, but again, you know, this is all about, you know, understanding the needs of your business and, um, you know, what, what the, the true SLAs are around um, making that data available. Cool. Well, then I think that definitely describes the concepts really well. I, I appreciate the fact that we did definitely did the part about Delta Lake and structure streaming, especially trigger once. And just to reiterate what Craig McLeish are talking about, even for pseudo batch jobs, it's quite appropriate. So just need to understand we're going to be sending these slides out with the uh, session that actually has these links that you see here. So that way you can dive deeper into that because we really want to switch to demo mode, right? So let's go do that. So why don't we switch to that? And then you, I'm sure you're going to have lots of questions. So for the person who just asked, where are we going to share the slides with the links? We will uh, right after the session, it'll show up in the YouTube channel. Uh, so that way uh, it will be there. And so let's go ahead and dive right into the demo, please. Awesome. Thanks, Jenny. Um, cool. So. Uh, you know, for this demo, I think we're, we're going to split it into two parts, right? So one is going to be focused on the actual ETL portion. And, you know, when we talked about, you know, this medallion architecture, bronze, silver, gold tables, uh, you know, all that uh, processing is, is going to be covered in this notebook. And so we'll kind of explain uh, concepts along the way. Um, and then we have a secondary notebook, which shows, you know, some example queries of how you might actually access this data. Um, I think we, 
we, I don't know if we've mentioned this yet, but uh, you know, we we do have a a blog post that's coming out sometime in the next few weeks uh, that you know we'll, we'll also cover this in in much more detail. Um, and so once that blog gets released, um, you'll have access to these notebooks then as well. Cool. All right. So. Uh, you know, the way we designed this notebook uh, at a very high level is to either allow our customers to, you know, who who already have, are, are already using audit logs to, you know, specify a source and sync bucket, but, you know, th that's not strictly necessary uh, to run this demo. Uh, we do also have um, a, this data source option using widgets within Databricks notebooks to specify, um, you know, th this, uh, this uh, synthetic data set that we've hosted on, uh, on GitHub. Cool. So first thing to do is, you know, for the purpose of this demo, just uh, you know, if this audit logs database already exists, we'll drop it. Uh, if you're doing this uh, in your own environment and you actually have an audit logs, you know, database, you probably want to remove this. Uh, but just, you know, it's something that is kind of a convenience uh, convenience section. Um, again, you know, we'll, we'll start off with some imports. You know, we're making sure that we have all the libraries and functions that we need uh, available. Uh, and again, this is some code about, you know, how to process or you know parse that fake data or um, or to get the actual S3 bucket source uh, uh, specified in these widgets up here. So, you know, as we covered uh, before, uh, the way that Databricks delivers audit logs today is we we send them as JSON to uh, an S3 bucket uh, that, you know, uh, our customers specify. And so uh, what, how we start off is, you know, in order to uh, instantiate this uh, streaming data frame, uh, we need to first grab the schema. And so, you know, we, we, we use the, the Spark JSON data source, we read uh, the bucket directly and we, we grab the schema from there. From there, uh, we instantiate uh, our stream reader, right? So uh, we're, we're loading directly from that source bucket. And then we're, uh, we're using the schema that we had, we had already grabbed. Next step would be to instantiate the actual, the actual stream writer, right? So this first step is where we, we, we take the data that are um, the raw JSON files, and then we, we just write it essentially straight, straight into a, a Delta Lake table. And so um, what we do is, you know, we, we, we use the, the stream writer API, uh, we specify the format as Delta, you know, we partition it by date. Um, we set these checkpoint locations. You know, again, you know, this, this is where we talked about the state management for structured streaming. Um, and, you know, this is where you, you need to specify the checkpoints so that structured streaming knows uh, you know exactly uh, how much data it's already processed, so that the next time it, you run the job, it'll only process those data which um, you know have not been processed since, since the last checkpoint. Um, and so here we specify a couple of other options, like you know where exactly we want to write out to, um, and then again we use that trigger once option. Here we have a little bit of code that uh, just ensures that you. Uh, the, the streaming query finishes before uh, we move on to the next step. Uh, and so, so for here, we, we just, you know, while, while the streams are active, we ensure that um, uh, it stays awake. And then, you know, the next step would be uh, to create uh, a database if it doesn't exist, right? So what we did up here with the, uh, with the stream writer is we, we just wrote out the, uh, the raw files uh, in, in this Delta Lake format, um, but we actually need to, uh, create an entry uh, in our, you know, Databricks internal meta store uh, to ensure that, um, you know, it, it's, just, it's just more easily accessible for end users. And so what we do is we, we uh, instantiate the database first, and then we create this bronze table. Again, the bronze table is completely raw data. It's essentially the JSON that's just been copied in. And the next step would be to optimize uh, the bronze table. And so uh, as Miklosh covered in his slide, um, you know, we do have uh, these performance uh, focus capabilities for uh, for Delta Lake on Databricks. And so in this case, um, you know, what we recommend is, you know, if you have batch updates to these tables um, that you uh, you optimize them every every time you write. And that, that'll increase the read performance, like, like Miklosh mentioned, uh, we compact files together to ensure that uh, read performance is, uh, is as performant as possible. 
So to help clarify what Craig's talking about, instead of actually having all these small little files that are prototypical of streaming, now what you end up having is some compacted files that are larger in size, not too large that it takes forever for it to read, but at the same time, it'll actually be large enough where the overhead of reading a lot of small files is basically avoided. So that way you have faster reads just like that. So that's what the call after the optimize is. Awesome, thanks, Danny. Um, cool, and uh, you know, we, Mikosh also referenced uh, this request params field uh, that you know uh, is let, let's say evolving, right? Because you know as we add uh, additional services, as we add uh, more events that we log, uh, we do uh, keep them all in this one kind of canonical struct, right? And so if if we kind of look ahead to how we want to architect this. Um, you know, when, when Databricks ships the audit logs, we include events from every service that we track. Uh, uh, we, we kind of combine them all together. And so eventually what we want to do with each of the gold tables is we want to have a different table for each service name. So uh, examples would be, you know, we'll have uh, a separate gold table for jobs, a separate table uh, for clusters, for example. And so, you know, what we want to do is we want to actually take this request params field that um, you know, it's meant to, to cover, you know, every event type for, uh, for every service name. And we want to actually strip it down uh, and, you know, create a, a schema for the request params for each of those specific gold tables. So, you know, you'll, you'll, the request params probably have 150 to 200 fields, uh, you know, when, when they come raw. But, you know, for, for a given service name, like clusters, there might only be 20 fields that are relevant, right? And so we'll, we'll kind of go through... Uh, this process that we um, we've developed to ensure that you know for that clusters table we only have uh, those 20 fields so it's it's just you know a little bit easier to uh, to analyze uh, the events cool and so you know what we do here is we we define uh, we define this function um, that uh, you know for every field it will uh, strip out all the nulls for that particular field so you know let's say you have this one event um, Within you know the cluster service name, uh, it, it, you know, it's it's going to be if we left the request params as is, uh, they would be you know a very sparse struct. And so uh, instead, what this what this function does that we eventually define as a UDF so that we can use it uh, uh, in Spark is it'll it'll remove all the fields that are null, so it'll leave you with you know just those you know five or six fields uh, that actually have values. Cool. So, hey, Craig, just wanted to chime in yes. real quick. Uh, could you clarify uh, why the, the care for sparsity uh, in terms of like why you prefer not having sparse data in this case for your structs? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's, it's just um, as you're as you're doing your analysis and as you are uh, trying to make, uh, you know, make use of the audit logs, uh, if you have a sparse struct, it just becomes much more difficult to parse out what uh, what's actually relevant and what's not relevant. And so when you have uh, a struct that's not sparse, you can just see, okay, I'm going to look in and I can see that there, there are five or 10 fields. So I know, I, you know, it's, it's much easier to sort through what's relevant for this particular type of event that you're trying to track or this particular question you're trying to answer rather than, you know, having to sort through 150 fields only to find that they're the relevant value. They're only relevant values for four or five of them. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, no worries. Uh, cool. And so, you know, again, you know, like if, if we if we go back to our this medallion architecture that we talk about, where we have bronze, silver, and gold tables, with the bronze tables, you know, completely raw. Now, as we're moving into the silver tables, this is where you know we're starting to apply transformations like stripping out the nulls. And so, what we do is we <clears throat> we use utilize this function in Delta Lake um, called table to table streams. And so essentially what we do is we take this bronze, uh, this bronze table that we have, and we can actually you know, instantiate a stream reader from that. And we can actually write to um, our new silver table. And so what we do is we instantiate our stream reader. Um, we give it the path to uh, the, the underlying files for, for, the, uh, for the bronze table. And then you know, we're gonna apply these, the following transformations, right? We're gonna strip all the nulls as we mentioned with that UDF. Um, we're going to take this um, email uh, struct and we're going to parse or we're going to parse email from the user identity struct. Um, 
we're actually going to you know parse uh, the timestamp into something that's a little more human readable, um, and then we're going to drop the the raw request params and user identities. And so, you know, this is totally fine for a silver table because you have all the the raw data in your bronze table, right? And so, what that allows you to do is, you know, let, let's say you find some kind of issue in your data pipeline uh, in silver or gold. If you have all the the raw data in bronze or very close to raw, you can actually just replay the entire pipeline to make sure um, that you know any any mistakes that you found. Uh, can be corrected. Uh, and so here, here's a here's an example of what I was talking about with the request params. You know, it's um, it, oh, I guess in this case it's not it's not too too bad. Uh, but uh, you know, in, in the case of um, some others, you know, it, it's yeah, I can. Uh, the, well, the number forget. of fields can be pretty overwhelming. Yeah. Don't, for, don't forget, this is also fake generated data as opposed to real live data. That's so, right. <laughs> so That's right. Thank we you. Did, oh, we, yeah. we, you <laughs> forgot. We, we didn't want to overdo it, right? <laughs> that's true. That No, that, that, that's, that's totally fair. Thanks, Sonny. <laughs> cool. And so uh, here, here's the actual um, uh, query that we want to uh, instantiate for the, for the stream writer. Um, so this is where we actually follow all the steps that we detailed above um, with uh, you know, stripping out the nulls, uh, parsing email, parsing uh, time, and then dropping the raw fields. So again, uh, you know, we are, we're checkpointing. We have a separate checkpoint because this is a separate stream. And so in this way, like you know, raw to bronze is, you know, that has one set of checkpoints, bronze to silver, that has another set of checkpoints, and then uh, silver to gold, you'll see, has another set of checkpoints. So we also specify uh, the path that we're writing out to, and then again, we're uh, we're we're doing we're using trigger once. So again, you know, we we write a bit of code to ensure that uh, you know while the stream is still active, that we don't advance the cell. Uh, and then uh, again, like we mentioned before, um, we're writing all the raw data for the silver table, but we haven't yet. Uh, register that table to the, the Databricks Hive Metastore. Um, and so we register it again to ensure that uh, we, you know, it, for ease of access for, for the end users. Um, and so this is just a, a little extra guarantee to make sure that, um, you know, that the number of, of records in, in bronze and silver are the same. Uh, this is not something you actually have to reason about because of structured streaming, but it's just something that's in there to, you know, for added comfort. And then uh, last step is to, to optimize, as we mentioned before, this is something that you want to do uh, um, uh, every time you, you uh, run these batch jobs that update these tables, right? So you wanna make sure that um, as, as often as possible, you're able to compact the files to, to maximize your read performance. Cool. And then, uh, you know, there, there's gonna be a, a bunch of code that, that happens uh, in the in this uh, in this next few cells, um, but um, essentially what what we're trying to do when we create the gold tables is when when we created that silver table, what we did was we actually stripped out uh, all the nulls for for every given event, right? So um, for every you know uh, you know X Y Z event that happens in X Y Z cluster uh, uh, service, um, you know we we've only kept those keys that are relevant for that event. Now that that's actually not going to be uh, completely comprehensive because you know if if we look at kind of the the total set of possible uh, you know uh, fields in in request params for uh, for a given service name, it's actually there's actually probably going to be you know fifteen or twenty even if every kind of event within that service name only utilizes three or four, right? So <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what uh, what we're doing here is we're actually just we're grabbing um, all the keys for every service name, and then we're we're using that to uh, define the schema um, at the individual gold table level, right? And so in this case, uh, the the request param fields that are going to show up at the end of the, um, you know, in those gold tables, uh, they themselves are, you know, it's not going to be sparse, but you know, maybe for every event, uh, it may only be a quarter to, um, you know, a half filled with with actual data. And so, you know, the, that that's something that you know. Maybe is uh, maybe maybe like a little a little more cumbersome, but you know compared to having you know 150 to 200 fields with you know 80 percent of them being uh, null is you know this is something that we find is, is much easier to to deal with. 
So, so basically the context is that because of the nature of the data you have, it was, it's actually makes more sense than instead of having a single one single table with basically 150 fields. And even if you removed like, you know, the nulls and all that stuff, it, it would still be pretty sparse in some ways versus multiplexing it out into multiple tables. Is, is that the context here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rock on. That's, I, I always love multiplexing. <laughs> if for another reason, just to say it. <laughs> Awesome. Um, cool. And so uh, what we what we do here is we define this function that um, allows us to you know create a, a schema, essentially a schema per service name, and then write that out to an individual table. Um, and again, you know we we are using uh, structured streaming. Um, and so in this case, uh, you know this is the transition from silver to gold, right? And so uh, here we're, we're we're doing our final and any final enriching of the data, um, we do define uh, our, sec our separate checkpoints for, for these gold tables. Um, and we also define a location where we actually want to store the files. Again, using trigger once. And then here what we do is, so here we're, we're getting a distinct value of service names, uh, essentially. So, you know, we, we know how many gold tables to, to create, right? And so uh, what we do uh, with this is actually we, we loop through each uh, service name, and then we uh, we run that function to essentially create that table. And again, you know, as as we've done with with uh, with our bronze and and silver uh, transformations, we have this uh, kind of helper uh, helper code to ensure that um, we uh, we don't advance the notebook uh, while the while the streams are still running. And then here, what we're doing is we are uh, registering each of those gold tables to the Metastore, like we did for, for bronze and, and for silver. And then again, for each table that we've created, uh, we, we run optimize to ensure that uh, you know, we're, we're avoiding the small files problem as much as we're able to. And then, you know, as we mentioned before, uh, this assertion that's not really necessary, but we put in there for extra comfort. Uh, we, we take the total count of the silver table and then we uh, we take the count of all the gold tables uh, and we assert that the, the row counts match. Cool. And so now, uh, you know, we, we have these, uh, uh, in this case, we have a bronze table and a silver table. And for our fake data, we, we only took data, uh, you know, from one day uh, from the cluster service name. And so the only gold table that we, we output was clusters, but, you know, were you to run this on the full Databricks audit logs, uh, you'd have clusters, jobs, and, and every other service name. Cool, that's pretty awesome. So you know, so to, it's simplified for the purpose of now and just in terms of clusters, but to, to over uh, to overemphasize that point, you know, in a re real audit log, you would just see bronze and silver, you would see clusters, jobs, multiple other tables multiplexed out from the single table. So that way it allows you to go ahead and focus, uh, allows the analyst to basically focus on just the services that they care about. Yep. Rock exactly. on. Exactly. Perfect. Cool. I know um, we have a few questions before we get into the next part of it. I think it would be good just to answer those questions. And then, yeah, by uh, all means. Go for it, please. Cool. Uh, I've been reading them, Craig, so <laughs> while you present, so I can answer them. Uh, the first question comes, um, and I'll read them out loud, is the conventional or traditional Spark applications that people are really familiar with in other distros uh, can have a different set of Spark configs, which are provided with each application. Databricks is a little different in that we expose a cluster level Spark config. And the question is, is there a way we can provide a different config for different applications that are on a shared cluster, not just for, um, for, just for, we, okay. Can we set different application configurations that run on the same cluster within Databricks? Now, that's a great question. The, the model of Databricks is we're helping to tune and configure the clusters for our end users, but that, also allows you to still provide configurations for different applications. The real meat of the question here is, if I have different applications running, can they have different parameters? 
Now, Spark supports different types of parameters. So the answer to that question is yes, you can, but it depends on the type of configurations you want to apply for that application. If you wanted to, there, there's session configurations in Spark that can be applied per application on a shared cluster. But if you are submitting jobs similar to how we're going to be submitting this job, ideally, you want to run it on its own cluster, help with fault isolation, help with cost management and tracking of utilization as well. So for these applications that are more production level, we recommend that you launch a job, it runs your application, then shuts down the resources. And so that it's efficient, you have no idle time in your job that you're paying for, and that you can apply all those different kinds of configurations. So the next question is, besides schema validation, there was a blog last year that talked about Delta and something called data expectations, which will be a new API that will allow you to define rules and actions for your actual data types and incoming data and be able to do this on the Delta Lake tables. Now, that's still coming soon. Um, and will be uh, announced late at a later time. So that's still something that's being developed. The next question comes uh, from specifically on where Databricks can run on the Azure Databricks platform. And the question is, can we send these logs to ADLS Gen 2? My understanding is there's actually multiple ways that Azure can provide those audit logs. You could tie it into the log analytics service that they offer. They also allow you to place these into a storage account of your choosing. So yes, we can uh, write all these audit logs into your own storage within the Azure Databricks platform. Now, the next question is, can Databricks also ship the cluster logs, driver standard out, et cetera? Yes, that's, that's configurable at a cluster level. So within each cluster, there is a logging directory and we can ship logs to whatever storage you would like. So you can have logs shipped to different types of storage if there's different sensitivity, but also in, into a common log processing bucket. Now, the last question is, can we go into a little more detail as to why we used read stream and write stream with a trigger once daily instead of a read and write once daily. So Craig and I actually were collaborating and we went down the route of using read and write batch job with Spark. Now, one topic that we had to discuss was how do we handle later writing data? And how do we handle the validation of what we've already processed. We wrote some code to do this, where we would do a diff between what we've processed and what's, what's new. We looked at the different dates that we've processed. Uh, and, and that was a good amount of code. And then while we discussed this, we realized that Spark Streaming actually does this. That's what Spark Streaming is for. Now, we, we don't have a real-time feed of data. It's not coming through a pub sub system where we're constantly getting data. So we have the benefit that we can run this as a pseudo batch job, but leverage the streaming application to handle the later writing data, to do the diff of the different files that we've processed and to keep that checkpoint. So we don't have to maintain any of that state. That's all maintained in that checkpoint folder that Craig has described in this ETL pipeline. So with, with read stream and write stream, we're able to reduce the amount of code because we let structured streaming do the heavy lifting for us. The read stream is at a bucket level. We'll look through and see what new data has arrived. The write stream will make sure we're only committing and writing out what's been updated. So that's really gonna help us simplify the code. One more question that just came in. If read stream reads data from the Spark data frame, then why downstream to say write to Delta tables any different than standard batch? 
Is there a difference in the actual data frame? Is there any difference between the actual data frame we get in terms of partitions and logs? So there's no difference in terms of partitions and logs that are coming in from the data. So the read stream is the, the bulk of it because we're reading as a stream, we're generating the track point, uh, but the, the, the complementary action from a read stream is you're gonna write stream. So you have to use those, you read stream, you write stream, and then you define how the streaming operation happens and trigger once is a method where we say, we're gonna read it once, and we're gonna write it once, and that's gonna complete that action for today. Perfect, uh, Craig, I, uh, Nicholas, excuse me. Uh, thanks very much for answering those questions live. Uh, in, in, for the sake of time, since we only got about 10 minutes left, why don't we shift right over to the, the auto log qu uh, qu example queries, please. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, so as mentioned before, uh, you know, with this fake data, uh, we're focusing specifically on you know, the, the events for one day uh, within uh, the cluster service. Um, and so, you know, and as we, as we talked about, you know, like why when we're motivating, you know, why you should use odd logs, why you should care, um, you know, one of the, uh, yeah, like one of the main applications of auto logs is for monitoring and just understanding how your users are utilizing, uh, you know, all of your compute resources. Um, and so, you know, this notebook is going to be an example, you know, walking you through how you can use uh, these data that we have, you know, transformed from these, uh, you know, raw JSON files that um, are, are a little, a little cumbersome to use, um, and into something that's that's much easier to analyze. Cool. So, you know, again, we'll use the, this audit logs database, um, and then here, uh, you know, now if you want to know how many clusters your end users created uh, on a certain date, uh, it's as easy as writing a query like select date and count star from this clusters table, right? So, you know, whereas before you might have had to sift through the JSON and you know, try to kind of understand like where you need to uh, to set your where clause. Um, now uh, you can just uh, focus on uh, uh, you know just the clusters, and then you can you know you can just focus on this one action name create, which you know is is much more intuitive to, to understand. Uh, and so here uh, we see that for you know December twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen, uh, we've created about seven hundred clusters. Um, so you know again, this is, there's not much context here because uh, you know we have um, we don't have the data from any other day. But you know, for the sake of this exercise, let's just assume that uh, the number of clusters here is would triple of any other day, right? So something that's a significant outlier. Um, and so, and then the other assumption would be uh, you know that the number of users does not change meaningfully from you know from one day to the other. Um, so you know, as, as we think about this and how how users uh, utilize the platform, uh, chances are the only way that there could be you know such a massive spike without any change in users would be um, that you know, they were created programmatically using something like jobs. Um, and again, since you know uh, December twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen was a Saturday, uh, you wouldn't really expect people to be you know using Databricks, or, or maybe maybe they would you know using Databricks on a Saturday. Um, and so, you know, we can use uh, audit logs to kind of investigate that. Well, well let's clarify that. Don't forget, this is fake data. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And so, you know, since we, we do have additional uh, information about um, the cluster creator tag, um, you know, so what we can do is we can actually, um, you know, from the request params that we've now cleaned up, you know, which are now, e it's now much easier to inspect. We can see that, you know, for this particular create event, you know, we had 709 uh, um, events, you know, from the job launcher, right? So, okay, so that 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 goes to confirm our kind of intuition about, um, you know, where where this might be coming from. And so we know that you know before we had seven hundred fourteen clusters, and seven hundred nine of them were created by the job launcher. Again, like that that that's something that um, should definitely jump out. And the, you know the way that the Databricks naming convention works for for job clusters, uh, you know, as Miklosh mentioned with. Um, his, uh, you know, when he answered the question about uh, setting Spark configs, um, when when Databricks provisions, when when you submit a uh, an automated job to Databricks, we provision a brand new cluster every time the job runs, so that uh, it only lives uh, just for the duration of the job, right? And that's about you know ensuring that uh, you're using your resources optimally. And so, 
uh, this name, this is the naming convention that we follow. It's job dash job ID dash run dash run ID. And you can think about this like the job is just um, the entity or like, you know, like the uh, kind of as it exists in Databricks, uh, you know, it could be a notebook, it could be a jar, you know, uh, one of those two things. And then let, let's say it's set to run daily and the first day was Monday. So Monday would be run one, Tuesday would be run two, and Wednesday would be run three, et cetera, right? So the job ID does not change, but the run ID will increment. And that that's the cluster name. And so if we're trying to understand, um, you know, if, if there's a certain job that's, uh, you know, creating, that has run many, many times and is creating a ton of these clusters, what we can do is we can actually uh, parse the cluster name into uh, the job ID and run ID separately. And so in this case, um, we're using, you know, Spark SQL function to split on hyphen and then grab that, um, grab that second element, right? And so in this case, uh, so we run this query uh, on, on our clusters table. And now we see that um, the job ID that's in question is 31303. So we know that okay, the vast majority of, of these uh, job runs are coming from this one particular job ID. And so if we, if we go down a little further, um, so if we see that job, uh, you know, job ID 31303 uh, is, is the culprit, um, we can actually uh, parse the user ID from the audit logs as well to get uh, the actual person who is responsible. And so here we see it's uh, user ID 101364. Uh, and so in this case, uh, you could utilize the Databricks Skim API to, uh, to, to actually extract the email address of that user. And, you know, again, um, you know, when we talk about audit logs, like it's not just about, you know, identifying, uh, you know, misuse of resources or anything like that. It's also about giving you tools to educate your end users, right? So in this case, we have user 101364. We can send uh, that person a quick message or an email and just say, hey, like you, you have this job running. It's, it's let, let, let's talk about this. Let's, let's figure out what, you know, what exactly, um, how exactly you configure this job uh, such that it, you know, um, exhibited this behavior. And then uh, the, ne the, next, uh, the next thing that we, uh, we had talked about, uh, or not next thing, but you know, one of the things we had talked about was um, just looking at uh, interactive clusters without auto termination, right? And so uh, this is one of those uh, things that we talked about, you know, being a potential anti-pattern, right? So when uh, when users create these interactive clusters, and you know, if they if they uncheck auto termination, uh, essentially the cluster will never terminate, right? So you will have you know these underlying cloud resources uh, up uh, indefinitely, right? And so you know, what you want to do is you want to, um, you want to identify these clusters so that you can, you know, A, uh, you know, ensure whether they should actually be up, whether there's um, compute actually occurring or if they're idle. Uh, and then, you know, the, uh, the flip side of that would, again, be to, uh, to discuss with uh, the users who created those clusters um, to let them know, hey, like, you know, this, is, this isn't something you should do. You know, please create uh, clusters with auto termination in the future. Super cool stuff. So it's basically what you've done is showcased with this notebook, a real quick way for you to go ahead and analyze the data right down to the user level if necessary, but down to understanding the cluster level and be able to make sense of the data almost immediately right off the gold tables. So super compelling. Yeah, um, exactly. Any other a, a little call out notes? Oh, sorry, before I call notes, there are multiple questions about can they get access to the notebook? So can they get access, access to the, the data? So as a reiteration, we will be posting some of these resources immediately after on the YouTube channel. Some of them we're gonna be delaying till a little bit um, around the 20th or 21st when the blog post comes out. There's an accompanying blog post that comes with this particular tech talk uh, and it'll actually have even more details so you can dive deep into it. So the, the blog post will be there and we'll post that of course in the YouTube channel and inside the blog post, we'll have the notebooks and the, the data <laughs> that we used inside for, uh, for this. So that way you can go ahead and try this out yourself first on fake data as opposed to on your real data right away. So that way at least get yourself familiar with the system first.